good morning and welcome. Well, it's, it's strange to say this, but we are together in a room. So thank you for being here and all of you online. Um, this is a fa fabulous day. You will enjoy the conversations. We believe that the future of our cities is a very timely and a very important conversation that all of us need to engage in. Whether you are in technology, outside of technology, it touches all our lives. Uh, we have a packed agenda, uh, great sessions, so please go online and take a look and join as many as you can and keep those questions coming in. So welcome, I'm Sabina Saxena from Smart North. We are, we've organized and hosted this event for the last three years and this is going to be another great year. And thank you to MinDot for sponsoring this. With that, I'm going to introduce Tayo Daniels, who is another founding member of Smart North. Tayo is a um, technology person, he believes his life was changed with technology. He's a founder of Eterna Media and also a founding member of Smart North. You will see him throughout the day. He'll be the MC for the day. So, Tayo, over to you. Thank you, thank you. How is everybody? <laughs> Incredible. So, I know you guys heard us say technology changed my life, and it's absolutely true. Um, there's so many wonderful things about technology that I can't explain. And coming from somebody that, you know, didn't necessarily grow up with access to technology, that now where I'm at now, I can see the difference in lives. I mean, because of technology, you have people all over the world that are being able to monetize and make their lives better. And that's something that really helped me. So I'm very passionate about this subject, and I'm excited to be here. And there's some great lineup, great speakers, and it's just going to be an incredible night. Okay, you guys ready? So strap in your seatbelts. All right, so the first individual that I would like to introduce to you, I've learned so much in quite a, a short amount of time, and I understand why he is the director of the Design Center at the University of Minnesota, um, a thought leader across the country, um, and he's just done so much, and he's actually one of the founding members of Smart North, so I get to pick his brain all the time when we're on Zoom calls and make my life a lot better. So please, without further ado, introducing Mr. Tom Fisher. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, we have a, a panel of myself and two of my colleagues uh, to talk about the uh, post-pandemic future. And uh, to my left is uh, my colleague, Varajita Singh. So maybe I'll let Varajita introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Um, very pleased to be here. My name is Virajitha Singh. I serve as Associate Vice Provost in the Office for Equity and Diversity at the University of Minnesota, and I'm also a design faculty and researcher. Yeah. And uh, I think we have our uh, other colleague, Abby Asojo, uh, who is uh, remote. Uh, she's uh, our Associate Dean for Research at the College of Design. Oh, there's Abby. Oh, Abby. <laughs> Welcome. Abby, can you hear us? Oh, well, that was Abby. And so uh, if she comes back, she, she also uh, has a, a lot to contribute to this. So what, what I thought I would do is just um, frame up a little bit about what the three of us have been doing this past year and a half and uh, talk about some of the entrepreneurial opportunities of the post-pandemic world. Uh, we've, we've had a whole series of research projects underway, some of them supported by McKnight Foundation. Uh, we looked um, at, uh, for example, the impact of the pandemic on uh, retail, on offices, on housing, uh, on transportation as part of a series of workshops that we did, community workshops right through the pandemic. And we focused on um, uh, Marshall and Lake Street, which is a street that, as, you, as some of you may know, goes right through St. Paul and through Minneapolis. As this, and looked at a series of nodes along that street to look at the impact that the pandemic will have on all of these kind of normal activities that we have. Um, and that publication is just about done uh, out of my center. Uh, as well, uh, Varajit and I had a podcast um, on the post-pandemic world, um, and that continues. Um, and uh, out of that, I also was blogging during the uh, entire pandemic because I have actually been writing about the impact of pandemics on cities since, well, since about 2010. Um, and one of the things, um, just as an overarching idea to keep in mind, is pandemics accelerate us rapidly into the future. 
and they've always done that. They did that in the 19th century with cholera, which basically accelerated industrial cities because of indoor plumbing and sanitary sewers. The, the 1918 flu pandemic ex rapidly accelerated suburbanization because of the desire of people to have private automobiles li live in single family houses and socially distance from each other. And what this pandemic has done is rapidly accelerated us into the digital future. It has now given us all the choice of what we do in person and what we do remotely as we're doing right now. And um, that means that everything we do has a digital twin. And uh, there are enormous entrepreneurial opportunities, both in the digital space to think about there has to be a better, easier way to do this than what we're doing now, uh, which is still a little clumsy, uh, as well as enormous opportunities in physical space because every physical interaction now has to justify itself in terms of the experience that it provides. And so we're going to have to rethink everything. What, what is a store? What is an office? What is a home? What is a vehicle? I mean, what, what do we do in vehicles? What do we do in these places, these environments we create? And so the opportunities are enormous. So out of that blog came a book, which I've, I've written and Rutledge is publishing. It'll be out early next year on the post-pandemic world. Um, and then in addition to all of that, as if that wasn't enough, Varajit and I taught a class last summer, and Varajita will talk more about that. But then Abby, Varajita, and I have um, also been doing a series of webinars in our college uh, involving really people from all over the world uh, talking about this issue. So what we wanted to do briefly this morning was just to talk about um, the range of things we're doing. Uh, we had slides, but I don't know if we're going to be able to show them. Um, and um, so, but, but with that uh, sort of introduction, I thought I would, uh, Roger, it's okay if I turned it over to you and you can talk about our, our um, oh, here are there are slides, there you go. Well, if we could run through those quickly. Um, I don't have the controller here. Um, so he, he, here we are. Uh, the, here's the three of us, uh, Abby, Varaj, and myself next, if you can. And, and so this is the point about rebalancing the digital physical world, having more choice, uh, next. Um, this is the blog, uh, next. Um, that's the cover of the book, uh, next. Uh, this is the series of workshops that we've been doing. Um, uh, in uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis, uh, next. Um, this is our podcast that mm -hmm. Roger and I do, uh, next. Um, and then this is the uh, webinar series uh, that uh, Abby, uh, Roger, and I have been leading uh, in our uh, college, uh, next. And so I, I think I'll uh, turn it to you, Roger, to talk about that our class. That sounds great. Um, so, Tom Fisher and I, and Megan Voorhees, who is at the Institute on the Environment, um, uh, co-taught this course. Um, it's, it was basically called Post-Pandemic Venture Design. And um, the idea was to take design um, to just uh, different disciplines and envision what a post-pandemic future could be like. So if we could go back to the slides, I'll walk through um, some of the things our students um, looked at. Uh, next, please. Um, so the, yeah, this is fine. Um, so one of the student groups, we had about five student groups, and one of the groups t uh, basically focused on families, and, and they were trying to figure out how to network and bring family-to-family -family connections. There's usually agencies and others uh, working on this issue. So they talked about rethinking that in the context of the pandemic. Next, please. Um, another group focused on work, and uh, next, um, basically, the pressing need was, of course, childcare. And I know you've seen statistics about how many women have actually dropped off the workforce uh, during the pandemic because of their additional responsibilities. So this idea was bringing work as well as um, childcare together and having flexibility. Next, please. Um, the third group focused on food systems and what could be done uh, in the pandemic, but also kind of leapfrog to the um, addressing food insecurity. Next. Um, so this was about mapping. So here again, you see digital technologies and platforms being used to really, um, in real time, we have all of these tools, they're just not put together in this context um, before. Next. And then the, um, I think this is the last group, but 
basically, this group was thinking about equity issues and how to bring more diverse students to design professions and bring, uh, create a pathway there. And how can we leverage the passion and interest of college students who want this to be a diverse world with college, um, with high school and middle school students and so on. And so next, I think they were thinking about this idea of changing things, bringing college students and high school students and also bringing resources and mentorship um, to basically create a more inclusive world by design. So um, I guess the, uh, what I'll end with saying before I give it back to Tom is that I think design thinking um, is at the core of the course we taught and is one of the key processes that are, are going to be useful to all of us, not just designers. Um, because the pandemic is a time where we've literally had to rethink everything. Well, the University of Minnesota, as you know, is a big organization, often slow moving, but we pivoted to online teaching, completely online, mind you, uh, in five days. And that, that's unheard of before. So I think this is the moment where we're being called not only to bring our creative capacities, but also our flexibility and you know, improvisation which is at the core of design thinking. And so our goal was to bring those um, mindsets and tasks in the class, but we also found an interesting thing uh, from the class. Now, this class was a, at a hard time where there's a sense of isolation, students are dispersed and we don't have the classroom. And yet at the end of the class, because we put them in cohorts and teams, we found that the students had a really great experience and we were surprised. We were cautiously optimistic but didn't know. And they all said that they felt a sense of belonging because they were in this group, but not only because they were in these groups, because they were envisioning the future together. And that was key. And we think that that is relevant for ev all of us. If we get into that mindset of envisioning the future and reacting to what's coming, towards us, which is changing, you know, moment to moment. That's the way to go. Great, thank you. Um, and another thing that the th three of us actually worked on was a research project with Ramsey County to reimagine the delivery of government services. I mean, one of the things that uh, Varajit and I have worked on, as well as with Abby over the years, is this idea that design thinking is about sort of uh, reimagining uh, the ways in which uh, we deliver services. Most of our disciplines have focused on goods, on, on things uh, in the design fields, but now the redesign of services is this enormous new area. And so um, Abby uh, was the lead investigator, and I think I, if Abby, you can, um, uh, chime in here, we have some slides from our report. Basically, we worked with Ramsey County to sort of uh, connect government service delivery to the library system and to reimagine what a library is in the post-pandemic world as basically a place that you can access any kind of information. And so th that's what we did with, with the county. And Abby, I see you on the screen. Uh, can, um, you, do you want to launch into a bit about our project? She can't hear. Okay. Well, why don't um, I'll uh, if you could uh, go to the next slide. I'll, uh, we can talk about it. Varaja, do you want to talk, or do you want me to? If you can talk oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you can go to the next slide. So, um, essentially, what we did is um, sort of reimagine the spaces. Um, uh, we, yeah, go to the next slide. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, essentially uh, this notion of service redesign for around health. Um, so what we did is we did a series of studies of various Ramsey County libraries in terms of how to uh, uh, socially distance people while they were still able to use the library. And uh, so we uh, reimagined um, the circulation patterns, basically had one-way patterns in and out. Um, uh, but as part of that, we were uh, also sort of again, reimagining um, how interiors are going to be used in the future. If you go to the next one. We worked with a colleague in the School of Public Health uh, looking at uh, how viral transmission occurs. Um, if you go to the next slide. So these are just some of the uh, images of uh, how libraries may, in fact, serve in the future as workplaces. 
Uh, so they're not just a place you go to get a book and leave, but it actually becomes a place that you can uh, turn into your office. Uh, next slide. We also looked at um, how there could, be, in fact, be government offices in libraries for the delivery of service. So part of the idea of the pandemic uh, is to uh, um, deliver knowledge in a wide range of ways. It can be remote. Um, there are still some people who might want to come to a, a, a government office, but the idea increasingly is that we have to take service to people. And so this idea of delivering service in a distributed way is, uh, we think, another characteristic of the post-pandemic world uh, that we're already in um, and we've already been accelerated into. So, so I think that that's it. Yeah, yeah go ahead. One point. Um, one point related to this project was that um, uh, we noted that Ramsey County approached us, and it was interesting. I think they they heard of our work through the webinars and, that we've been hosting, uh, Abby, uh, Tom, and I, and at the School of Design, and basically uh, said, could you work with us? We are on the front lines of trying to serve people through the pandemic, and could you work with us um, and advise us on what needs to be done? And so we kind of became this partnership and envisioned that even as they were prototyping what it is like, they had these group of nav what they call navigators, you know, uh, trying to figure out how the systems need to work. And so maybe that was the innovation to take away from this project also, that we need to partner across agencies, across academia and um, public sector and nonprofits to really um, share this, um, you know, co-creative process and solve problems together. So that was one takeaway. Yeah, I mean, this idea of everything being hybrid. Um, I mean, the course I'll teach later this morning is uh, being taught hybrid. Uh, so I'll have some students in person, some students remote, as we're doing right now. And, and you're constantly in both the physical and the digital world simultaneously. Um, I think this other point about navigators is interesting because I, we see in the post-pandemic world a whole range of new jobs that we even sort of s tried to find a name for. So we came up with navigator um, uh, because there just is the need for somebody to help other people navigate systems. Um, and so that will be, we think, a big and growing uh, area of work for people. So even as automation is increasingly eliminating a lot of jobs, or at least parts of jobs, there, um, in my book I talk about the changing nature of work, where um, many aspects of almost every job are, are now getting automated, and of course many jobs are getting automated out of existence, but what we're not paying enough attention to are the new jobs that are being created. In my book, I talk about them as the six C's. When you look at the history of work, you realize that there are about six categories of jobs that are um, resistant to uh, displacement and automation, particularly. And those are caring jobs for other people, communication jobs, most people prefer to talk to other people rather than to a machine, um, uh, craft jobs, making things, creative jobs, construction jobs, and community jobs. And so uh, one of the things that I argue in the book is in the post-pandemic world, we are also coming out the back end of the Industrial Revolution, that we've been automating a lot of things that machines do better, and we're finally at the point where we're actually automating a lot of white-collar work um, and what is left for us to do, people to do, is what we actually did before the Industrial Revolution, which are these six categories of jobs that, in which people are better doing with each other. And so again, the, the one way to think about the post-pandemic world is that there will be a lot of digital interaction that we will all have because a lot of our work will be done digitally for us and with us. And then there are the things that we will do with each other as people, um, which will also be really important. Um, and so reimagining the work landscape in terms of um, the kind of new jobs that are out there, and a lot of those new jobs are kind of old jobs that are now digitally enabled, is, is also, I think, part of this future. Well, in the uh, time we have left, uh, Roger, you look like you have something more yeah, to say. Yeah. One more thing to say. I, I encourage everyone to look at um, Gensler's work in research around the pandemic and the workplace. Um, specifically, I, um, you know, their work 
that came out in 2020 talked about how mobility is going to be a big issue um, for workers and uh, employees. Choice about where we go and what choices, especially around health as well. Um, issues of privacy, we've all been used to being home and private, um, and that's going to factor in. And then also health and well-being I mean, that's obvious with the pandemic as well. And then this summer, they've done more research, and it's interesting to see they, they're expecting the top performing firms, for example, to, to continue to grow their real estate, which is interesting. It's counter to what we thought was going to happen. And it's because uh, they're seeing that employees want to get together at certain times um, for their creative brainstorming, but at other times want to be, be able to work uh, remotely. And they're also talking about this notion of this third place. So it's not just work and home, but also possibly co-working and coffee shops and so on. So I think we are fully entering this hybrid world, but in new ways. So we're seeing these shifts even from 2020 to 2021. Yeah, and there are even new kinds of uh, building types or new kinds of services that are being provided. There's this new phenomenon called the neighborhood clubhouse, which is starting to emerge in cities around the country. And really what it was was people realized that people were working in coffee shops. You'd go to Starbucks or Caribou to work. Well, they realized that th it was really the office. The coffee was just the, the sort of the price of admission. So they're flipping that model. So basically it's a kind of um, a neighborhood co-working space where you can get the coffee for free. So you don't have to pay for the coffee to work. You work, and you can you can pay it with all kinds of different rates. I mean, you can be hourly, daily. You can have a subscription. There's all sorts of different ways in which these neighborhood clubhouses, but they also gives you access to technology. So this is a kind of activity that we didn't even have before, which is starting to rapidly emerge around the country. So again, this is how pandemics create all kinds of entrepreneurial activities for those who understand the nature of what's going on. I think another aspect of pandemics is it changes our spatial temporal relationships. So uh, one of the things that I think we've all experienced is, as obviously is happening right now, is that we can log into things happening essentially anywhere in the globe. Um, and, uh, and so the early issue is just the time zone that you're in. Space no longer matters, right? And so it's a, the, this ability to um, be both uh, living very low locally and then being digitally connected globally is I think going to be another aspect of the pandemic world. So thinking about what are all of the global digital connections that we haven't even imagined yet and then what are the supremely local physical things like these neighborhood clubhouses that we haven't thought about yet. So those are two vast areas of entrepreneurial activity. It is also gonna change transportation. It's gonna change our need to move around. We will increasingly move bits rather than bodies. And so as we uh, think about transportation, we have to think about it more broadly than just getting into a vehicle. And then we also have to challenge the question of why get into a vehicle. Do I really need to go to a place when it's, fa fa in fact, faster to Zoom? Um, and so I think these are also, uh, all these relationships that we've inherited from the 20th century are now um, opportunities, really. Well, yeah, should we take questions? Or I can, um, uh, we have an audience here, and I don't know if there are people online who want to ask questions or even how we would do that. Uh, but, um, yeah, any, does anybody here in the, the audience have a question? And Tayo, you're coming up. Do you want to take the mic? All right. Fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Virajita. Yes. So what's interesting, um, you know, I like the, ter the, the terminology uh, hybrid world. You know, and it made me think that, you know, a lot of times we only thought about that like in movies. We thought, like, that's going to happen in the future. Well, guess what? That future is here now. And I think uh, the, the pandemic, you know, expedited the process. So we need to have these conversations. You know, events like this is what's going to make it happen. You know, um, the digital twin that you had mentioned, that is so important, especially in the entrepreneurship space. Um, I tell this to so many local businesses that if you have a business and you're not somehow connected, you know, to the digital world or have some type of technology, you will get left behind. 
Um, and so many people don't know how to interact in these spaces yet. I mean, even myself, I'm learning. And I have a, a, a media tech company, and I'm still learning every day. You know, nobody has the, you know, the, the perfect solution. But one thing is for sure, the only way we get there is through community, coming together and gathering around. So I want to appreciate you guys' time. And then did it, with, do we have any questions from the, the, the digital world, I should say? I don't know if we had any questions from the digital space. Or anybody in the audience have a question for Mr. Tom Fisher? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, I'm giving a talk about this to the downtown council in a couple of weeks about this very issue, the concern that uh, people have about uh, our downtown cores, right? <clears throat> One of the things that we see, of course, we're already seeing a dramatic drop in demand for office space. Um, you know, we saw what Target has decided to do, basically abandon an entire building. Uh, and there are many law firms, for example, one that I know that had four floors of a building, they're going down to one floor. So they're still going to have offices, but there's going to be fewer offices, they're going to be more shared offices. So then the question is, what do we do with all these office buildings? Well, the first thing we have to do, and this is a general rule in a post-pandemic world, stop using the old names. Stop calling them office buildings because it limits what we think they can be. It's space, right? And so what we're going to see in these office buildings is they're going to become radically mixed-use places. There's going to be housing in them. There's going to be production activities going in them. There's going to be child care, as, as our students discovered. The, the main reason to get people to come back to the office if you can provide child care. Um, so it's going to be uh, many different things on different floors. Um, and so part of this is uh, on the public sector side, we've got to become much more flexible. We've got to stop imposing our 20th century zoning policies, um, rethink our building codes that allow for people to do what they need to do in order to make this economy work. That's very exciting. <laughs> so I don't know if Roger. Um, you know, all of this talk about change, right, um, makes me think, not, if this is not specifically answering your question, but there's this unrootedness that's happening. Like, people are being uprooted from ways they've been thinking, Tom suggesting t stopping using names, etc. You know, these are things that people anchor to. And so that's something to keep in mind, that, uh, which brings me back to design and design thinking. At the core of all of this is this notion of empathy, and even as we are being propelled forward in this new world, we've got to come back to this uh, piece about empathy in our, you know, personally, for self, for others immediately, and for our society as a whole, because there's a lot of transition, and humans typically don't like too much transition. We like being familiar with things as well. So how do you balance that when there's so much transition is a really key point as well. To be Thank you, thank you. Are there any more questions? Any more questions? Yeah, the, so the, uh, the question about the, the neighborhood clubhouses. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the, the idea behind it is the neighborhood piece to it. So we work, for example, you know, is a, there are obviously co-working spaces that exist now. Um, and uh, they will continue. I don't think that this is a replacement. But one of the things we found is that as more and more people are working at home, they just want to get out of the house. Either the house is somewhat chaotic, maybe the kids are around, or, you know, they're just lonely, right? And so this was an idea of being able to literally walk to the corner, what used to be the corner store now becomes the corner tech hub, um, the corner meeting space, the, you know, the place you can go just to be with other people, even if you're not even working with them. So that, in that way, it's a little different than a co-working space, where you're typically in a co-working space with others that are working on a project. This would just be a place where you can just go to, to be someplace other than your home. And um, 
so that's an example. And I think this is one of just many new kinds of services we're going to start to see. Again, building on what Roger was just saying, think empathetically about people's uh, lived experiences. What are your, what's your daily life? And what would you love to have to make your life easier and, uh, and better? And that is where all the entrepreneurial opportunities lie. Great questions, great questions. Anyone else? Man. Yes, you may add. Thank you. I'm thinking about these things uh, that are emerging from our last year's experience. So, for example, the work-life balance uh, piece, right? So, how many of us connected more to nature since the pandemic began? And part of it there, I see hands go up everywhere. Um, part of it was that we were, we were locked in and it was our natural response to want to get out and it, nature seemed the safe place to go. But on the other hand, we've also discovered the benefits of being connected to nature and ha having, um, you know, having a work-life balance that integrates nature. And work-life balance in general, you know, not sitting in traffic, you know, for our peak hour commute and taking breaks. You know, I've heard of colleagues uh, go for walks during the middle of the day and so on. You know, so I think if we can sort of hone in on those pieces and, and want to preserve them as we're being pushed into whatever is ahead, that's another thing to remember. Another thing that I think the pandemic has done is it has enabled us to give us choice about where we live and work. So we're seeing the rise of what are called Zoom towns. And, and so actually, uh, there are smaller communities, even fairly remote communities, that if they have pretty good internet access, are finding a, a, a tremendous influx of people. And so this has uh, been a challenge for some of these communities. So I think the whole idea of the urban-rural split is also going to be um, sort of challenged by all of this, because I think we're going to see, again, a lot of opportunities for smaller communities to focus on quality of life, like access to nature. There may be other reasons why people may decide to live where they live. And, and so, again, I think that this is, uh, I think having more choice is good, but I think it also can uh, help us overcome some of these differences that have evolved between, say, cities and rural areas. So. Yes, I mean, and it's interesting that we're, we're, we're at this point. Um, a phrase that I, that I, I live by is, uh, through struggle comes breakthrough. And um, that's what I feel like is happening right now, as, especially with my company at Eternity Media. When the pandemic first hit, we were panicking like most individuals. But now looking back, we, you know, th that was actually our best year of business because it forced us to start to think and to come together and look at our opportunities and look at the beautiful possibilities. And I learned so much from that, that you know, from now on moving forward, it's like when we come through different crises, you know, problems, struggles, we need to come together as a community and discuss these things because they're, underneath all that stuff is endless possibilities. You know, and we want to create these possibilities. You know, the workplace that's out there, I mean, just, just that it's alone has been just, just mind blowing. Um, how many, my sister works for the uh, Department of Natural Resources and she loves it. She's been working at home every day. She's been able to go to the office sometimes to do what, you know, the immediate stuff that she needs to do. Um, she's raising a, a, a child and, and, and she, before she could have never imagined that. And now it's possible. Yeah. One thing also I just briefly want to mention is I think also we have to make sure that everybody is able to participate in this economy. So digital equity is really, really important. And um, I think one of the concerns we have in our center is that we're going to get an influx of infrastructure money from the federal government, and we're going to put in a lot of 20th century infrastructure. We're going to put in a lot of roads and bridges when and what we actually need is digital highways. We need uh, broadband access for every person in this country. It needs to be like the 1930s with a electrification. And so this has got to be our focus because this is how you participate in the economy going forward. Uh, you had a question. Sure. This question actually comes from Nisha Botchwe, who's attending virtually. Nisha says, I am fascinated by the pivots noted by Dr. Fisher from the previous pandemics. Can you comment on how the current pandemic is impacting youth and their engagement in the civil society? We know the experience is uneven in many areas, education for example. What are the implications for youth in the broader engagement and participation in their various communities? 
I have to say that Nisha is our new dean of the Humphrey School. Uh, so, Nisha, thank you for joining us. She's at Georgia Tech, a colleague. Of, we've actually co-authored a couple papers. Um, so she'll be a fabulous new dean. So we've got some other new deans coming, too, a new director of the Wiseman Art Museum, who's also fabulous. So in any event, Nisha, great question. I, I think, um, you, you know, uh, Smart North, we're actually involved in um, the development of a new way to think about tech hubs for youth, um, enabling uh, young people who don't have access to technology to be able to uh, access it in these tech hubs, but also to think about these places as safe spaces. One of the things we've found in my center working with youth is they don't have a safe space to go to. And so we are envisioning this actually uh, at George Floyd Square in Minneapolis as a place where the students can go to be safe. Maybe it's also where you can get food. Maybe if, if need be, you stay overnight there because you don't feel safe going home or whatever the issue might be. So it's more than just access technology. It's enabling youth to be successful and to, and, and to be able to have the kind of lives that they, they, they deserve. What I'll just add to that is that um, what we learned from our classes and um, the, the students' approach too, that I, I think if we can um, invite the youth to shape our future with us, that will serve not only them well because they have a sense of agency and so on, but it will serve us well because we are the ones tied to the old ways of doing things and they're ready and have the ideas. So I think um, this is a process comment that we've got to bring them to the table in multiple ways in universities and beyond. That was a great question. And I actually work on um, the Teen Tech Hub Center with Tom. So we have a lot of these conversations. And being that, that being said, um, there has to be digital safety as well. That's another conversation that needs to be brought up, is how are we being safe in these new spaces that we're entering? Um, and that's why we need to have these conversations now, you know? So, do we have any more questions? Do we have time for one more virtual question? Okay. Okay, last question from um, Patrick Erickson. Tom, how do you view the emergence of third spaces in the less urban areas that many city dwellers are migrating to? So third spaces in, in smaller communities, yeah. Well, you know, the thing about um, many smaller communities is that they already have often a, a, a greater sense of community maybe than a large city does. But, you know, part of this is sort of reimagining uh, assets that these communities have. So for example, there are many small communities where the churches have cl closed. And so there's a lot of empty churches in rural America. And so we're beginning to reimagine those as these tech hubs as these places where people can go, co-working spaces, they already have all the facility there, uh, they can become a kind of community hub. So um, again, um, not calling them churches anymore, just think of them as space that are places of opportunity and reimagining them I think is uh, uh, something that smaller communities might think about. All right, I think that would wrap it up. Um, let's thank the moderator, Mr. Tom Fisher, who has a plethora of knowledge. Virajita, thank you so much. And I'm Bimbola. All right, thank you guys.